hosted by Mike, the Big Cheese. to the Heavy Metal Mayhem Radio Show. It is Sunday, August 4th. The beginning of August is here, and we're inching closer and closer to the end of the year when the show will be pre-recorded and not live anymore. I'm hoping something changes around here in Spreaker where they kind of like go back to the old way and let hosts do live shows. I'm going to miss doing it live, but we'll still be on the air every Sunday night at 6 o'clock. The show will just be pre-recorded two hours before then and then uploaded at that time. All right, we got a great one for everybody tonight. Michael Gilbert from Flotsam and Jetsam. The band have a brand new record out called I Am The Weapon. It is probably one of their finest records to date. Following up, Nick Marino from NZM will be calling in in the second half of the show. 
It's going to be a great one for everybody tonight. Right there, Dark Angel, we have arrived. The band is finally working on that follow-up record. Uh, it should be, I'm guessing, in 2025. To me, there's nothing like those first two Dark Angel records. They are my favorite. You know, Don Dottie kind of got this whole reunion thing going, and they kind of pushed them out. <laughs> we had him on. I, I can't remember the name of the band he was doing at that time. Um, I'm drawing a complete blank on it. Nothing ever came out of it. Uh, but... You know, he kind of got the ball rolling with Dark Angel, and then they kind of booted him out, and Ron Reinhardt was back in again. Ron was a great singer. I like those last two records he did with the band, but I love the first two with Don on vocals. To me, those are the classic albums. To me, that is Dark Angel. All right, let's get to another one of my favorite bands here. Seems like all we do is play my favorite bands on the show, right? <laughs> That's why I have a show, so I can play what I like. All right, here you go. Torch, Ray J. <laughs>
heave and pray for death. Uh, we got to get to Michael in a few minutes. So I want to play some uh, Flotsam and Jetsam first. Uh, I don't know. I mean, we don't usually play Marilyn Manson on the show, but I was listening to the new track he just released. And I have to say one thing. He does a better Lizzie Borden than Lizzie Borden does. So <laughs> that's all I got to say about that. All right. How about we, oh, right there? Heathen, pray for death. Let's get on some classic F and J. No place for disgrace. We'll talk to Michael. We'll get on some songs off the new record right after that. Here you go. <laughs>
Mike. What's going on, man? Uh, not much, man. I'm talking to you tonight, so it's a pretty good night, I got to say. <laughs> right on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, you know, I'm such a big fan of the band going back to the very beginning, and I'm happy that you guys are out there still doing it, and not just doing it, but putting out records that keep getting better and better. Oh, dude, thank you, man. Uh, it, it's just, it's, we're just stoked to be uh, still relevant, you know, like all the, all the years we've been doing this, and uh, it, it's amazing to me that the, this lineup we we're we've got so much gas in the tank. There's so much fire. Uh, we're not even close to. Uh, uh, we feel young. Uh, you know what you know what I'm talking about. We're not even close to ever giving this shit up. It's in our blood. Uh, so to still be relevant, I, all I can say is fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the most important thing. And, yeah, I mean, you feel like, I mean, you know, you came up through the scene in the very beginning when it was just getting started and everything was new and fresh and every band that came out was making an impact in one way or another. You know, 40 years later now, I mean, how's the business to you these days? I mean, it could be a rough business. It's probably harder now on the business side of the music than the music part is. But is it more fun now? Is it, is it easier now? Is it, is it less stress than it was back in the early days with trying to get signed to a major label and, and making headway? Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's less stressful. It's a different kind of stress than what what was back then. You know, back then stress was going uh, getting to rehearsal and then belting these songs out and stuff like that. Now with all the software and stuff, it's really easy to write music and uh and uh network with the rest of your bandmates, you know, and and make changes on the fly. I mean, it's just it it's super easy these days, but there's more challenges now too, you know. Uh being a musician is not an easy, uh, I would say job, but I can't even consider it a job because we have too much fun doing it, you know, but it, it's, not, it's not easy. Uh, there's a lot of aspects to it and there's, you know, labels, uh, streaming services, everybody's got their hand in the band's, uh, kitty, you know, which is unfortunately, uh, it makes it even more difficult for bands that are starting out. It's like, it would have freaking nightmare for bands these days. It is hard. You know, Jack Gibson from Exodus just said to me, he goes, I'm not a musician. I'm a T-shirt salesman. Goes, I, <laughs> I saw that. To, I have to go out there and, and sell merchandise. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, you work your whole life to, you know, to master your craft, to create something that's different, new, original. And you got to worry about how many T-shirts we're selling now because if we don't sell enough, maybe we won't be able to play next week. Yeah, I mean, he's he's totally right about that. That most of our sales, uh, our income when we're touring is is merch stuff, you know. And even at that, there's a lot of clubs now that are that watch your merch and they take a percentage of it. Which, again, you know, it's like, hey, we're bringing people into your bar, and now you want some of our. How about you? How about you uh, help with the cost of this? You know, some of these places want twenty percent. So. Like, okay, of what we sell, why don't you give me 20% of what it, what it costs us to make it, and then that's fine. Otherwise, fuck off, you know? Uh, it, it, it's just – they're just finding more ways to nickel and dime bands to where, you know, bands are giving up, and just it, – it's tough, man. You, you, see people, you see bands that have been around for 40 years that are just like, uh, I, we got to tap out now, you know? So yeah. – it's, it's, it's crazy. I mean, I heard about that for the first time a year or so ago that, you know, clubs are getting a cut of bands' merchandise. And I'm like, I, I, like, I, I was shaking my head. I couldn't believe it. You know, it's, but it, it's, it's, I mean, it's just it's the music thing. It's a, it's a business thing in general. Airlines charging people to take luggage on the plane when you know you have to have luggage to fly to go away somewhere. Everybody finds a way of taking more money out of someone else's pocket. And it, and it, and it trickles down to everybody. And in the end, the bands get hurt the most. <laughs> totally. Yeah, it, it's like that with luggage because uh, we fly quite a bit, you know, and, and and we'll find cheap rates. And then you look at the small print and it says, hey, your bags aren't included. And it, when you're taking guitars and you're taking uh, drum hardware and stuff, things get pretty pricey, you know. And the first bag's like 50 bucks, the second bag's 100 bucks. It's like, geez, even the airlines are nickel and dime in the bands. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's crazy. And it killed me because last year I was looking forward to seeing you guys in Brooklyn. We had that. Two week tour lined up. You had to cancel it. There was stuff going on with the band and and the tickets and everything else. It just kind of shows, you know, where the world is at right now. And I mean, you know, we came out of COVID and I mean, all of a sudden the market got oversaturated. Everybody was out there trying to make up for two or three years of not being able to play, put out music. So I, I kind of get that it was hard at that time. But is it a little better now now that things have kind of calmed down and sort of gotten back to you know semi normal? Yeah, uh, it's definitely getting better. And you know, especially with the international stuff. Like things are really going good in that aspect. The United States is still 
it's it's difficult to tour here, you know, because now you've got gas prices, you got all these these added expenses, and you know, gas is expensive, especially when you're on a tour bus or a bandwagon or something like that. You know, you got to sell a lot of shirts to keep that stuff going. Um, and that that tour, that that two week tour that we were going to do back on the East Coast, I mean, it it sounded great when we were planning it. All the numbers came in okay, but the sales, you know, I think there was so many shows that were happening at the time. The promoters were calling us and saying, "Look, you know, we're going to give you guys a, a an out here because there's you know low ticket sales." But that's kind of to be expected with type of music because you get mostly walk ups anyway, right? Yeah. And then they when they they walk up and then they also buy a t shirt. So, you know, it's kind of a hit or miss on that. We decided to pull the plug on it. I know that was a uh, 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 not a not a great decision for a lot of people, but that was the decision we had to make in order to do it. And unfortunately, uh, you know that it blows that we had to do that. But you know, we'll be back at some point, hopefully. Uh, well, there's stuff in the makes right now. I can't give you any info on it, yeah. but <laughs> we'll get to that when it happens. But yeah, it's true. Most people just do walk up and buy the ticket right then and there because they've gotten burnt by a lot of shows getting canceled, things happening, and they don't mm-hmm. want to deal with the refund process. So but it, it is a shame because if clubs are going to start solely relying on pre-sales, like to decide whether they want to keep going through with it or letting the bands know, hey, we didn't get the pre-sales that we thought we were going to get, you know, a lot of things are going to start getting canceled. You know? Yeah. And, and you're seeing it more and more, and even over in Europe, you're seeing cancellations and stuff. But you know, and times are tough right now. You know, people, uh, their money's not going as far as it used to. So they're saying, do I, do I buy food for my family or do I go see a metal show? You know, they got to buy food. So it's very understandable, and hopefully times get better here pretty soon. But uh, yeah, it's just it's a little little bit of a sad time for metal. But at the same time, we're gaining new fans, and it's almost like the younger fans are doing what we were doing 20 and 30 years ago. You know, They're discovering this stuff and getting excited about it. So that aspect I'm very grateful for. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm so happy when I see young kids at a show. And I get people that, you know, call me up and ask me questions about bands on, like, the 19 years old. And, like, they've got this whole thing down already. Like, you know, they go back to the very beginning of our scene and they know it all. And I love it because I don't recall myself, like, getting into my parents' music when I was 19 years old. I was looking to do something completely different. But, like, you know, these kids today, and even my kids, they love it. I, my, I got grandchildren these days and I got them into this music and they love it. So it, <laughs> it is a continuing thing with the generations, you know? Yeah, so it, it's definitely metal is here to stay. Speed metal, all the genres of metal is is here to stay forever, which I'm I'm really grateful for that too. So, uh, you, know, you know, when Flotsam got started, you guys were a heavy metal band to me. Everything was heavy metal back then. Then everything started again, got parmentalized, and there was a thousand different genres of music. I mean, and I look back at your career and the entire output of Flotsam and Jetsam. I mean. I, I can look at it like it's a book, and there were chapters. I mean, you know, you could like Doomsday, No Place, When the Storm Comes Down, with one chapter. The next three albums sort of like represented a, a different phase of the band, and that was a different chapter. And it's kind of gone on like that throughout your whole career. I mean, obviously, as time goes on, your musical interests are going to change. Things that you hear interest you, you want to incorporate into your sound. I mean, do you ever consider Flat to be just a, a one-trick pony? Because you're so varied on albums. I mean, from album to album or decade to decade. There's always been some sort of experimentation mixing it with the classic F and J sound. Yeah, totally true on that. Uh, we've always experimented a little uh, with our songwriting, the capabilities, and uh, I don't know. It's just we've had a lot of uh, a versatility in our band as far as you know what we all listen to. Everybody listens to different stuff, not necessarily metal all the time. We're not all strictly 100% metalheads, and even this lineup that we have now, the current line lineup, is. Uh, even more versatile than ever. Uh, but we're, we're sticking to what we've been doing for the last four records. You know, we seem to be locked on uh, these last four, like you're talking chapters. What a great analogy. You're talking chapters. These last four chapters in the Flotsam book have been uh, very consistent with each other. You know, they sound like they should go together sequentially ending up with uh, uh, I am the weapon, you know, that, that it's not the final chapter, but, but it's the most recent chapter right now. So, yeah, uh, and with the with the lineup that we have right now, I think we have probably the best lineup that we've ever had as far as uh, musicianship and songwriting and stuff like that, and we're just really locked in right now. 
I, the lineup is great. It's been pretty consistent for the last few years now. Ken Mary, you know, uh, what a great drummer. When he joined the monster a bit in a before which was, who, who's just another a monster. And then when Ken came in, I was like, wow, I mean, these guys are really like firing all cylinders right now. And, and Ken's also a songwriter. So does that kind of help with the, his contributions? Oh yeah. He's a, he's a world-class producer. So having that in the band, which we've never had before, uh, it just brings a different aspect. It opens up uh, the songwriting capabilities immensely, and uh, and not only that, he's like like you said, he's a he's a great drummer. He's a fantastic drummer, and uh, he's a cool dude too. And he can write. He writes really good. You know, most people remember Ken, Ken was in so many bands. I mean, a lot of well-known bands too, but they always put him with TKO as like his like his main thing and. When they heard that he, they, he was joining the band, they were like, I don't see how that's going to work. And I'm like, no, when you're a drummer, you know, when you're a musician, you can play anything, anywhere, with anybody. And, and Ken proved that, I think, on the last couple of records. Yeah. You know, I thought the same thing. Uh, when Jason gave us the word that he was he was going to overkill, which, I mean, you can't really pass that job up, you know. Uh, what a great opportunity for him. And uh, Steve had known Ken, Steve Conley had known Ken for years and years. So he, he asked him. We were over in Europe at the time, and Ken sent a video. Uh, of him playing Hammerhead, and I watched about uh, maybe about 15 seconds of it, and I'm like, well, that's the guy. That's the dude right there. <laughs> you could tell. You know, we were talking about like how oh, yeah. diverse the band has been over the years. What would you think would be the, the one album out of the ones that you were on that you would say, you know, really went out on an edge on this one, really tried something different? I look at Ugly Noise, and I feel that was one of them, but to you, what do you think is the one album that really showed a different side of Flotsam? Uh, I agree with you on that. That uh, Ugly Noise is when Kelly and I had came back. We both had a, hi a hiatus due to management and some other issues and stuff like that. So we, we were out for a few years, and uh, AK had asked us back for Ugly Noise. And, uh, yeah, that, that was a little different. The, the way we wrote the songs, the way we recorded them, uh, just completely different than what we were used to. And, uh, you know, then the one that was following that, we did a remake of No Place for Disgrace, which I would not recommend that to any band. Uh, we got away with it okay. You know, the fans seemed to like it, but it could have went terribly wrong really quickly. Uh, you know, you're talking about sacred ground with some bands. And, and, you know, there's been fans that have expressed it like, what, what are you guys doing? You know, you're ruining my childhood, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. But we wanted to actually – we couldn't get the master tapes to remix it, so we had to re-record it, and we thought we would just up the production on it, make the production a little bit better. So we didn't mean to dance, uh, you know, in the – you know, what? A, we didn't mean to do that and offend anybody, but uh, we, we were okay. I think we uh, got out of it alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. Well, you know, that's the story of a lot of bands. They can't get the rights back to some of their old music, so they have to re-record it. Uh, to get it back. So when you, you when you say, hey, let's re-record it so we can kind of get you know get the music back, did you think about tinkering with anything that you said, you know, back in the day, I remember playing that song, and I was never crazy about this one part. I thought we should have sped this up or slowed that down. Did you take advantage of that to kind of tinker with the songs and make it more of what you wanted it to be back then with today's technology and what you know after, you know, 30 years of later of doing it? Yeah, we did a little bit of that. Uh, we, we kept all the rhythm guitars and the bass and everything. We kept it pretty pretty close to what we originally recorded some of the lyrics ak changed around a bit he wanted some different stuff and um uh, you know we we had some guest musicians too we had chris poland come in and play on it and he's always been like a a, a superstar to me you know like he's a one of a kind guitar player and for him to be playing on one of my records i'm, I'm stoked you know uh, so we had some stuff like that go on and then we had uh, all the all the original members played on it you know except for jason of course but you know, like you said, so many fans hold that album in such high esteem because it was, you know, the debut record. And it was one of your most classic albums back in the day. And they, they hold it to that. But, you know, they think that band members feel the same way about every album and every song. They don't realize that, you know, you're moving on. Album after album comes out. And sometimes after 20 years, you look back and say, I don't even remember some of the songs on that first record. Where <laughs> other fans are like, this is the greatest thing in the world. But they don't realize as a musician, you're always moving on. You're always writing new music. And you might not even remember some of the songs that were on that record back then. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny you say that because you hear a lot of a lot of fans would be like, oh, Metallica sold out or this band sold out or whatever. But they really didn't. They're just doing what they're doing, what they want to do, you know. So and the way I feel about music is it's a it's all opinion. You know, there's nothing 
the only thing that's factual about it is what's in your head, and uh, and that's all that matters is what is factual to you in your head. Uh, your opinions are completely different from anybody else's opinion about songs, music, or anything like that. So there is no, hey, this guy, this band is the best, or that band is the best. You know, I, I don't believe in any of that stuff. It's like if if you like it and it does something for you, then right on, man. You're that you're one step closer to God. That, that's so true. And I'm pretty sure Metallica's up there playing in front of 50,000, 60,000 people. And then I say, man, we really disappointed those two kids in the 80s who wanted us to say the same. <laughs> I'm sure that's the first thing they're thinking about when up there performing at night. Oh, yeah. That's going through James's head uh, constantly. <laughs> Just sending them back. <laughs> but, you know, Mike, you know, I Am the Weapon, the newest record. I mean, did you? I know when you did Blood in the Water, I believe, if I remember, you guys kind of recorded that separately. You did all your own parts in your own houses. It was during COVID. Did you kind of continue that with I Am the Weapon, or did you kind of get back together in the studio for this? No, we, we did it in our home studios, and we passed it around like a dirty whore, uh, you know, just sending files to each other. And it, that seems to be working for us, you know. Um, it, when we're finally done with it, we give it a listen and see see the flow of it and make sure that, it you know, there's nothing that that doesn't flow well. And if, if it's like that, then we'll change it, but – we sent everything off to Jacob Hansen. It came back, and I was astounded. You know, like uh, I sat down and listened to it. it was like, holy shit, uh, this is as good as blood, blood in the water. You know, that was always our fear: is we're not gonna, we're, our next record's not gonna be as good as our last one. Yeah, I think that's every band's fear, and uh, it's almost like you don't want to put yourself out there, but you do. And then when you get the mix back, you're like, oh, okay, right on. This is this is killer. And so far, the reviews and everybody that's heard it is saying uh, it's probably better than Blood in the Water, which was pretty hard to top. So I'm very stoked. Yeah, I think you did it. You would think after all these years and now 15 records, this is the 15th studio record by the band, that, I mean, you wouldn't feel that way, get that way. But I guess you're always going to have that little, like, anxiety, like, is are we going to do okay with this? Is it going to be all right? You would just think you say, you know what, we are who we are. We give them what we give them, and, you know, they should be fine with that. But you still do worry about that. Yeah, still worry about it. Uh, you know, I, we always want our fans to be happy. You know, I want to, if I'm relaying something on guitar, uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm hoping people are receptive to it, obviously. But uh, if they are, I want them to have the best production uh, they possibly can have, you know. Uh, and so they don't have to struggle to hear it. You know, we've had a couple records where you have to struggle to hear it. You know, even I go back and listen to it going, geez, this thing needs to be remixed horribly you know so um don't want to ever be in that situation again uh and just give people the best product that we possibly can do you think that any issue you might have with some songs some albums from the past aren't so much the songwriting process or the music that you guys created but more in the the engineering and production part of it because sometimes that could be out of your control when you work for labels have different people behind the, the board yeah uh B right there for sure is, is what happened on, on a couple of them. Uh, you know, you get too many hands in the kitty and uh, you were too many chefs in the kitchen, however you want to say it. And next thing you know, nobody can agree on something. So uh, what really matters ends up uh, falling by the wayside, you know, like the overall production. You get egos and stuff involved and, man, it can get pretty messy. It's a lot easier for for us to just give it to – you know, somebody like Jacob Hansen. And then and when it comes back, you're like, okay, there's no arguments in the band. Everything sounds good. <clears throat> Excuse me. And plus the other thing is, you know, they're hearing it from a different perspective than we are. We've sat here and listened to this for, you know, almost a year uh, playing through this stuff and revamping it, re-recording it. And uh, whoever's mixing it, Jacob Hansen in this case, got a fresh ear on it. He knows what he wants it to sound like and gives us his interpretation, which is completely different than what uh, what we think it's going to be. You know, so it's like it's like Christmas when that mix comes in for us, you know. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that because, you know, you're so close to the music when you're writing it, you know, repeating parts over and over again, listening back to everything over and over again. That It does get kind of draining and it kind of takes like, you know, that spontaneity out when you hear it for the first time as a thing. Like, holy cow, that riff is killer. But you're saying, oh, God, I got to do that again. And. But when you do hear that final mix, does it come back as fresh and new to you? Do you say, okay, this is what we, you know, we were doing? Yes, our last four records have been like that for me. Uh, the mix came back, and I'm just like, oh, okay, we sound like a band, right on, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, 
and I'm stoked about it. You know, I'm I'm super excited about uh, Blood in the Water was probably my favorite one so far, but I Am the Weapon is is right there with it. Uh, like I said, I'm just super proud. I'm proud of the the performances that these guys did, and uh, I, I'm just I'm super proud of my guys, man. You should be. This is an amazing record, and. You know, when you, you, so many bands today have that technology available to them. So a lot of bands or there are a lot of project bands that have members like all over the country, if not all over the world, they're doing it digitally too like that. They record in the home studios and they swap files back and forth. And I say to myself, like, how do you make that come together so cohesively where it sounds like everybody was there telling each other, no, no, let's do this, let's do that. And it's just incredible how it could be all put together to sound like such a final product where you would think everybody was there at the same time doing it. I just It's mind-bending when you hear it like that on your last two records. I mean, you would never know that everybody was in their own house doing their own thing and then just putting it together. It sounds like everybody was there, you know, feeding back off each other momentarily and, and throwing things out at each other because there is that spontaneity you get when you're in the same room. I mean, do you, are you able to come up with that also when you're going back and forth with files? You know what? That's like the pros and cons of, of it. Uh, definitely a, a con. Uh, the pro about it would be getting in a, a room and everybody just jamming away, you know, figuring out the songs and hashing them out and and listening to it really loud, how they translate. Uh, sometimes when you do that uh, in your home studio and you pass the files around, you're swapping files and stuff like that, you don't really know what it's going to sound like when you play it in a live situation. And we've even had that. We've Songs that sound great. We try to play them live, and it, they just – they don't translate very well. Uh, so it's kind of odd in that aspect, but I think we're we're 99% locked on to that now, you know. So uh, hopefully we don't play any stuff that uh, doesn't translate well live. We've always been a, a, a pretty dynamic live band, so. True. Sure. I mean, you, you talked about, you know, ugly noise, you know, Eric, so I want you guys to come back into the fold. Was that going to be a temporary thing, or was it something that you were looking at to make permanent again? Because you kind of set out the whole 2000s of the band. I think there were three records out during that time that you weren't a part of. And there's yeah. even a point in the band, I think, in the late 90s, early 2000s, when Eric was out of the band for a while. James Rivera came in to sing. I mean, I mean, how did you feel about that era of the band that you weren't a part of? Were you still keeping tabs on what was going on, or did you just, like, say, I'm, I'm done with it right now, and I'm just not even going to pay attention to it? I, I was done with it. I didn't listen to the stuff until after I came back, uh, only because, you know, this is my baby. It's like somebody sleeping with my girlfriend, you know, <laughs> and uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it wasn't a bad time. I, I don't have any ill feelings toward anybody or anything like that. Left on good terms, came back on good terms, uh, except for the management at the time. Like I, I really did not uh, like that person at all. Still don't. Stole a lot of money from us. <laughs> that that that's a story of music. I mean, managers, people behind the scenes taken from bands, record labels taken from bands. There was a time in the late eighties when you got signed. I think it was MCA back then, and you know, to a, a band that's got to be like a dream come true, getting signed to a major label. So when, it, when something like that does happen, I mean, is there more disappointment that comes with it, or more more happiness that comes with it? Does the label try to change everything about the band they signed for being the band they were? No. Uh, what, what was cool about when we got signed to a major was uh, Michael Lago signed us on uh, Elektra shortly after Metallica, and they they thought that it was going to be uh, you know the word of mouth type of thing because well it was it was a new type of music uh, and it was traveling you know underground all over the world you know and it was reaching people so Metallica didn't have like these big advertisements and stuff going on for for them to sell a million records that was all that was all just their music getting out and networked with all the me the metal fans that were growing 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 so they kind of thought the same thing was going to happen to us uh, and it didn't you know like we started coming into a new era uh big bands were getting signed on major labels all over the place and then we just got when we moved over to MCA we just got kind of lost uh Michael Alago was still on board with us huge fan super supportive did everything he could do to keep us on the labels and stuff like that but i think just the corporate world we kind of got lost in you know we weren't making gazillions of dollars like metallica was so but 
don't you feel it's like the label's responsibility? I mean, they do have to have some responsibility. Yes, they, they front the money to, you know, get everything going and stuff like that. But, you know, the hard part is getting signed to the label. After that, as a band, you have to say to yourself, now we have to do what we do best. That's write the music that we're writing, you know, perform the way we're performing. And the label has to do the rest of it for us because how much more could you do as, as an artist on a label? They, they should be promoting it, trying to get it out there. I, I mean, are they that big, these labels, that they could just afford to let a band slide by after investing money into them like that? Yeah, uh, I totally agree with you. It, but it's, I don't think they really knew what they were doing at that time, you know, or knew how to market a metal band because uh, we weren't in mainstream radio. Uh, it was fanzines at the time. It wasn't even like printed magazines or anything. I mean, it was crazy times. But uh, yeah, the, the record label, they, they gave us a shit ton of money. But, you know, what the, what do you do with it? You know, that all goes to tour support, it goes to all kinds of stuff. Uh, and actually making the record, which back then making a record was a couple hundred thousand dollars. You know, now you can do it for free out of your basement, basically, if you have the skills. But um, major labels, where are they at now? Though there's only a handful left. I don't even think MCA and Universal. I don't even think that's around anymore. If it is, I, I don't. I'm not getting any checks, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I don't, it's true. There aren't that many. It's mostly back to the old ways. You know, a lot of underground labels, a lot of smaller labels. I mean, AFM is a big label. You know, there are a lot of labels out there like that that are still, you know, putting the money into it and paying bands. So, I mean, it is hard. I mean, business-wise, it's hard. But when does it go wrong for a band? I mean, when do the members start turning on each other? Is it when things like MCA bomb out and it doesn't happen? Is that when everybody starts turning on each other? Or is it when something behind the scenes happens that makes the band members go against each other? You know, uh, this, that's an awesome question because I think it's uh, it's your goals, how you set your goals. You know, back when I was starting out, you know, my goal was to be like Angus Young for sure. But as I as I started getting in bands and stuff like that, I, I had to realize I like maybe maybe I should make my goal just to be in a good band. Okay, so I got to that goal. Uh, maybe I should make my next goal like I play out. You know, let's you know and make make your goals a little bit smaller and try to achieve those. Uh, and you'll have more wins, and you you guys won't have the tension. The bands won't have that that uh, you know the tension that's gonna keep them from uh being nice to each other. You know, if y'all got different expectations, you know, you guys got to hash that out and figure out you know reasonable stuff. I feel bad for bands these days uh, that are just starting out there. It's oversaturated. There's there's a lot of music that's really great out there, but there's a lot of really crappy music too. You know. And just to uh, siphon through all of it and figure it out, uh, and th and then play. Oh my God! Then you got to pay to play. Uh, holy smoke, man! There's just it was never like that for us. We didn't ever have to pay to play. Right. What kind of ridiculous stuff is that? Well, you know, you, you bands have to sell tickets to the shows. Then they got to pay to get on tours and stuff yeah. like that. It, it is crazy. I say to myself, you know, ACDC. I mean, you know, Metallica. Metallica still, you know, they're our age. You know, they're in the fifties. They're still out there doing it. But there are a lot of bands that are, you know, coming to the end of the line. They're just, you know, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and they won't be able to do it no more, whether it's the Rolling Stones or bands like that. Where are the next rock and roll bands coming from? Where are the next hard rock bands coming from that are going to play in the stadiums, go, go up to the big leagues? Uh, there's nothing – I don't know where they're coming from. I don't know any young band. I can't remember the name of the band. The ones that sounded like Led Zeppelin. <laughs> I don't remember the name of them. But oh, uh, Greta. Greta Van yeah, Fleet. Greta, Greta Fleet. What happened to them? Everybody thought they were going to be the next big thing. They were going to like, you know, move up that that line and get to the to the stadiums, and you don't hear from them at all anymore. I know yeah. they're out there, but you don't hear from them. I mean, so if a band like that, who kind of had that Led Zeppelin vibe going, they, you know, they were good looking guys. They had the image. I mean, where were the next bands coming from when ACDC says we're done? Exactly. You got ACDC on first base. You got Metallica on second base. And uh, whoever else on third, but who's on deck? There's no bands on deck to uh, to get up there and hit the ball anymore. You think it's because the labels did kind of collapse upon themselves with the digital downloads and everything that's happened over the last 20 years of music? Because, you know, you had A&R departments. They were like, you know, the minor league teams. They, they found those bands. They nurtured them. They brought them through the ranks. And that's what happened. I mean, for a pop artist, it's easy today. You got 10 guys in the studio writing a song that's, you know, as about as simple as it can be, and, and it just goes crazy for it. And, then, you know, you got a pop star. But, you know, for bands that really write their own music, learn how to play their instruments, try to do it on their own, it's, it's more than challenging these days. Oh, yeah. It's uh, definitely rough. I, I, would, I wouldn't say I don't recommend it, uh, but 
I would say, you know, just make sure that your goals are, are aligned right, you know, so you guys don't get frustrated and uh, end up being unhappy with what you're doing because I'm, it, it really is fulfilling. Uh, it's my favorite hobby for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's a good but, way of putting it. <laughs> my favorite hobby. Well, you know, listen, I mean, if you go back to the very beginning of the band around 84, but the band was in different incarnations before that. The Dogs and Paradox, I had different names as they were kind of working their way up and before coming Flotsam and Jetsam. But in 84, I think uh, Ride the Lightning had come out. It was on Electro Records. And I think at that point in time, I think all the, the heavy metal bands that were starting out before that, that thought this was just going to be a fun thing to do with friends. We're going to make music. Maybe get lucky and get a record out. Was it in 84 where every band said, you know what? We could actually make something of this. We have an opportunity, I think, now to you know, make a career out of this. I mean, what is the game plan when you realize that this could be viable as a career? Uh, that, okay, so that's that's an awesome question. I remember this very well because we were over in um, Jason Newstead's apartment practicing in his apartment, and we practiced every night. Uh, and it was this little room that was on the back of his apartment. It was like an add-on room. It was super skinny. It was – it stunk it was dirty it was it was the perfect jam pad it was so great and uh for us like like jason did all the uh uh like he sent out all the demos he did all the correspondence with the band so he was the dude that was shooting the demos out to metal blade to megaforce to all these places he was writing letters he was following up he was making the phone calls so essentially he was doing the management of it but there was no definition of what it was like to be a – or what you're supposed to do back then to be managing a heavy metal band. Uh, we got lucky. Slagle ended up calling us and saying, hey, we want to we wanna throw one of your songs on uh, uh, a compilation record, and you know, that, that song was I Live You Die. Then they signed us right after that, and then uh, we did a couple of short tours with, with that record, and then we did No Place for Disgrace, and that's – Jason Lee left just before we we did that record. He was on some of the songwriting, but uh, you know, he got drafted up to the, the big leagues. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> yeah. Well, when that happened, like you said, you know, you you lose Jason, you lose your bass player after like you know going into your second record. So now you got to find a new bassist. He was also a guy, like I said, was doing a lot of the behind the scenes work. You know, sending out things, doing the correspondence. Are you happy that he gets the job with Metallica because you say to yourself, hey, you know what, maybe that'll trickle down to us because people say, well, you know, Jason was in Flotsam and it'll bring some attention to the band. Or you say that, son of a bitch. <laughs> Which way does it go? Oh, uh, I, I was happy for him. I mean, that's a, wow, what a, uh, you know what, he was, the, I knew I knew what was going to happen when, when I heard the news about Cliff because uh, Jason was the right guy for the job, totally. His personality uh, he's a great dude. He's a great bass player, and he fits in with those guys, man. Like, he was the perfect fit for that that band. Uh, so hats off to him. And it, it, the only problem was we lived in this shadow that this was Jason Newstead's band up until probably ten years ago, maybe. And people are starting to finally go, well, you know, maybe Jason, you know, big part of those records, but. He wasn't the only one in the band that was Flotsam and Jetsam, you know. I mean, uh, like I like I was saying, our last two records are probably the best two that we've ever released. Uh, of course, I like the classics too, and you know, people always like that. But I encourage people to listen to the uh, "I Am the Weapon" and "Blood in the Water" and "The End of Chaos." You know, that that's really what defines Flotsam and Jetsam right now. I agree. I think when the self-titled record came out, 2016, I think that was like. Like, you know, Flotsam, you know, version two, if you want to call it that. I think things started taking a turn after that record and, you know, moving the band into not a different direction, but just into like a whole new entity, in my opinion. I don't know if you guys felt that way. Yeah, totally. And uh, but the other other thing about that is there's a lot of people that say, well, we didn't even know you had a new record out. Uh, and it's like, uh, what? And uh, so there, there is still we're still caught up in all these this giant mesh of so many bands that are out there there's so much competition and we're still even caught up in that because people don't know we have a record out uh so i i don't know how to combat that or how you know what it, I, I don't know i'm a loss for words for that because uh but, but yeah, see, also, I don't that, even know what to that, say. No, but that was also, uh, when you think about it, that was a really busy time for the band. I mean, the cult came out in 2010. That was right before you came back into the fold. Then it was Ugly Noise, the, the remake of No Place for Disgrace, and then the Flotsam record. So 
within like, you know, eight years or six years, there were four records out, one after the other, like every other year. So there was a lot happening for the band at that time. And, you know, people might not have caught up to everything yet, but I thought that the Flotsam and Jetsam record was such a solid record. And like I said, The End of Chaos, Blood in the Water, and now I Am the Weapon. I mean, it just keeps getting better and better. And, you know, after so many years of doing it, you ever just sit back and say, you know, I'm kind of out of ideas. <laughs> No, that's one thing that we are not lacking is ideas at all. I, we're already coming up with stuff for the next record. so <laughs> that, That's great. Was songwriting something that was always natural to you? Were you always a guitar player and a songwriter? Or was it stuff that you had to like learn as you said, you know, I want to be a guitar player. I want to get into music. It was something that you learned. It was something that you picked up. It came pretty easy to you. Um, definitely didn't come easy to me. Uh, but it was something I... I always fiddled around with like songwriting from the get go, from the second I picked up the guitar, I was trying to write stuff with it. You know, um, I wasn't a natural, like, you know, Jeff Loomis and all those guys, you know, Andy James and these just freaking awesome guitar players that are out there right now. But I, I could write songs. Those guys write great songs too. But like, that was kind of my strong point. The first, the first song that I wrote with the band was I live, you die when I joined. And that's the one that got assigned. And then, uh, I was always messing around. I had two – you remember those little tape recorders, those little square tape? Yeah, and you had to press play and record. I had two of those, and that's how I multi-tracked when I was writing uh, in my room when I was, what, 16 years old, 15 years old. I'd press play on one of them, and I'd record on the other, and I'd just keep bouncing them back and forth. sounded like shit, but (laughs) – and that's the way it was back then. Do you, are you still holding on to that one riff that you came up with that you thought was the greatest thing in the world, but you've never been able to put it to a song? Hmm. Yes, I think every guitar. Do you, you must play in order to ask that question. You got to play guitar. I played bass, you know, back in the back in the eighties. <laughs> <laughs> so you have feeling. a riff you're hanging on to too. <laughs> right. Well, you know what it is half the riffs I wrote. They like these. This is the greatest song I ever wrote that I played for the rest of the guys I've been. Like I'd ask Judas Priest. I'd ask Johnny Man. Like, oh, no wonder why it's so good. <laughs> you know, that happens too a lot. <laughs> you know, I've written I've written whole songs like this when I've written the riff and I think it's great, and I'll send it off to the guys and they'll go, "Hey, uh, just so you know, that sounds just like uh, a Slipknot song, or it sounds just <laughs> like." And I'm like, "Fuck." <laughs> Did you ever repeat yourself with one of your own riffs, <laughs> one of your own songs? Yes, I, I do. I do that from time to time. I'll uh, uh, I'll try to play it backwards and see if I can come up with a new riff. <laughs> well, whatever you're doing, it's working because you've been putting out amazing records. And I Am The Weapon is definitely <laughs> – I love what you're doing with this because the record technically doesn't come out until September. Uh, so you're like you know, giving like the slow build up, one song here, one song there. You just released the second single on the record right now. I think there'll be one or two more out before the official release date of the record. How much do you give out to people before the record comes out? Because you know how it was in the 80s. You put out that one single on a 7-inch, and then the record would come out not long after. It was like the wet people's appetite. Today, do you have to give them a little bit more before the record comes out? Yeah, uh, totally. You're 100% right there. I think the last two records that we did, we had two videos that were for each of those. That were, No, for the last one, Blood in the Water, we had two videos that were released before the album was released. Uh, and I don't think that the record label thought that that was enough time. So now we're doing four. Uh, You know, I think we've got a lyric video, two performance videos, and then uh, we have another video coming out. Uh, Shoot. I don't even know the date right now. I'm I'm at a loss right now, but it's in like a week. It's in like a week. So that's going to come out. And I think the record label is, uh, is, using that uh, anticipation well this time and they're doing it uh, a really good job at spacing everything out and getting the hype going it's definitely there i know i and the weapon is going to be a big one for you guys the official release date is uh, september 13th on, on afm mike i know you got stuff cooking that you can't talk about right now but is there anything that is coming up that you can announce and you're going to try to do the festivals this year or get on any of the shows like that i know you got the cruise coming up next year yeah, we've got the cruise, um, and that's like my favorite gig. I love that gig uh, just because I'm a I'm an ocean kind of guy. I like the beach and being on a, a, a cruise liner. That that's just all the beer right there, and I don't have to drive anywhere. Yep. <laughs> you know? That's true. I I feel bad for the guy that's got to clean the hot tub after forty hairy guys are in there. You know, every oh. hour. The hour. <laughs> I feel bad for that. Yeah, guy. that guy's job sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's going to be amazing being on the cruise ship. Anything coming up this year that you could talk about? Uh, we're leaving for Vakken in about a week, and then uh, we come back home for a couple of days, and then we go back over, and we do some club dates, and then Dynamo uh, in late August, and then we come back, 
and there might be something brewing for the fall. We're still working on that right now, or uh, we might be uh, right back to writing again. If if nothing's coming, we'll you know we'll hit the studio again. Well, I hope when you make that announcement, there's something on the East Coast because it's been a while since I've seen you guys live, and I'm kind of due. So. I hope it does happen. But, Mike, I'm not going to keep you. I want to play some songs off this new record for everybody. What an amazing job you did, like always. And you guys, to me, have never disappointed. I don't think you ever will. So as much as I'm happy about I Am The Weapon, I'm already looking forward to the next one. <laughs> Mike, thank you, man. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mike. Have a great time. Enjoy you know, all the success with this record. And hopefully I will see you sometime this year. Absolutely. Thanks, man. And thanks for having me on. It's my pleasure, Michael. Take care. Have a great night, my friend. You too. Thank Bye-bye. you. J, Gates of Hell off the I Am Weapon record. Pick it up if you haven't already. That was a pretty long interview. We got to get to uh, we gotta get to Nick in about five minutes or so. Not much time for music between now and then. 
I have to get on Christian's request. We'll do that next. Uh, I, I guess the big news this week was that Aerosmith, they're going to pack it in. They're not going to finish off that uh, farewell tour. Uh, Steven Tyler's vocals are no good anymore. You can't get them back to what they used to be, I guess. Hey, listen, they're in their 70s, those guys. Things like this happen. I mean, sometimes bands outlive the usefulness or they go on a little longer than they should have. This tour maybe should have took place a couple of years ago, but... You know, I wasn't the biggest Aerosmith fan in the world. There were some songs I like, a couple of albums that I like, but they never did anything for me. I mean, you know, it's just like, you know, the same thing with Van Halen. Most people talk about Van Halen with such high praise. I'm not saying they weren't great musicians. Every one of them was. And, you know, David Lee Roth is like the ultimate front man, but I just never got into that. I was just always into the hardest stuff back then, you know? Always looking for the next big thing, the next hardest thing I can get into. It usually wasn't me, but <laughs> I was always looking for that. All right, let's get on Christian's request right now. He wanted to hear Deliverance. Here's Victory. Thank you. 
with Lack of Power off the Metallic Alps record from back in the day. That should be my theme song. I feel like I have a lack of power these days. All right, Nick should be calling in any minute now, so uh, maybe we'll just, I don't think I have enough time to play another song, so we'll just wait a little bit. I saw that uh, Steve Riley's L.A. Guns, who had, no longer has Steve Riley in the band because he passed away about a year or so ago, released another song. I mean, is this really necessary? Is this what we need in this world? Do we really need more Steve Riley, L.A.'s Guns without Steve Riley? We didn't need Steve Riley's L.A. Guns when he created the band if they're getting the boot from the regular L.A. Guns or the second version of L.A. Guns. I'm losing track of which version there is out there of this band. Uh, right now, there's only the two of them. So, I don't know. Maybe they just change it to Kelly Nichols' uh, L.A. Guns since he's the only one that was actually in L.A. Guns now. But they really they put out an acoustic version of the Ballad of Jane. There's, nobody needs this. Nobody wants it. Who's going to buy it? They offer these special deals like if you prepay for the 7 you get to hear it a couple of days ahead of time before the general public does. People have heard that song for the last 40 years. <laughs> you know, they don't need to hear an acoustic version of it by a cover band. It's just insane what's going on out there. And I say this all the time. I mean, I don't know how many times I can repeat myself in this one, but... It's just absolute nonsense, in my opinion. This is definitely one of the bands that should go away. Them and Beyond Autograph and uh, Carnivore AD and all these bands that have no original members left in them at all. Not even one. I'm at the point right now where I'll take one original member. Even if it's the bass player like myself, I'll take one. Oh, my dear Lord in heaven. All right, I just got that uh, that Kill World record. Uh, Ron Kill put out a record called Kill World. And it kind of features, like, all of the bands that he's been a part of. And they're all new songs. Uh, you know, there's Kill, the Ron Kill band, his uh, country band he was doing at that time, Steel. There's a new song by Steeler on there. But, you know, every song kind of sounds the same. Not one sounds like the band that they originally supposed to be in. But that's because it's Ron Kill. All right, we got Nick on the line. Let's connect him. Get this interview going. Nick, this is Mike. You're on the air live. How are you? Hi, it's Nick. Yes. Good, good. I, it's a I, pleasure. Yeah, Nick. Yeah, I just uh, <clears throat> so we we are actually doing it on on the phone. Yeah. Yes, it's interview. a live interview. You're on the air. Okay. All right. Oh, I'm on the air. Okay. Cool. <laughs> okay. You're all ready to go. Here, Hi, so. everyone. <laughs> all right. It's a pleasure yeah. to have you on here today. Been a fan of your band for some years now. You know, I'm happy that you're out there doing this, and you just got a brand new record out, a best of record. That says a lot that you put out a best of record, you know? Yeah, yeah. This is actually 10 year, ten years anniversary of NZM. Our, our first album was uh, released in 2014, Internal Fire, and uh, we had like four or five albums since that time. And um, I used this opportunity um, since I signed a record deal with Fire Rock Group. Um, uh, we decided to, to make the best of NZM plus uh, one new song, which is the first one, No Innocence. And then the rest of the 11 tracks are <clears throat> from previous albums, uh, including three, um, three songs from the, um, from the solo Nick Marino album, uh, Freedom, Freedom Has No Price from 2010, which was uh, released by Rising Force, Force Records. Uh, and Ingram Austin back in 2010, and that that kind of these songs are kind of forgotten. So I <clears throat> did a remake of them, and uh, and uh, so that's it. You know, that's the the new album. Yeah, and that's how I first came across you was with the the Freedom Has No Price that record back in 2010. I mean, after that record, did you yeah. say to yourself, you know, I want to keep continuing the solo stuff, and maybe I just want to form a complete band around, it? and that's where NZM came out of. Correct. That's, um, yeah, I, <clears throat> I kind of, you know, I had, uh, <clears throat> I had a vision. I, w- I want to do the band, the actual NCM, uh, initial, initials of my, my name, uh, you know, and, uh, um, and that's why I, I started everything in 2014, but the songs there on, on that solo, solo record, uh, we basically play them, um, you know, every time we do a live show, you know, so the, this, this is really good record. Freedom has no price. Yeah. And a few Excellent. songs are also on the best of NZM. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, what was it like trying to form a band in 2010? I mean, heavy metal by that time, it started to come back again. People were listening to it all over. There was a younger audience. Did you find it difficult forming a band at that point in time? Um, well, yeah, you're, you're correct. The, the, you know, the, there was a comeback of, of metal, and, um, you know, especially I. I always had this uh, <clears throat> huge library of songs that I 
I was waiting the moment to 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 release them, and uh, actually, when uh, when when this was re- released by Ingwe uh, on his record label, I was really encouraged by that, and uh, <clears throat> and then. Uh, but, uh, however, the the Rising Force Records didn't. I, I think it didn't last um, um, long, and then he continued with a you know with a different like a label. So, so I decided to um, to form the my own band, MZM. You were one of the first bands signed to his label too at that time, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. That was great. I mean, you know, you know, Yingve, you know, anything involving Yingve, people that don't know you also sing for Yingve and play keyboards in his band, you know, for people that aren't familiar with that. I mean, having that has definitely got to be a little help in hand getting the band going because people know kind of who you are from playing with Yingve also. So it must be good for promotion when it comes to the band. Uh, yes and no. I, uh, I would like to, um, you know, I, I can just say that uh, Ingrid is wonderful, the best guitar player in the world, and, and it's a privilege to play with him. But I, I don't really want to go into, um, uh, because of the, you know, there's like a agreement, a confidentiality. So I don't, I don't want to go into the, the details. You know, this is like a separate thing that I do. I, you know, and just, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to promote NZM uh, at this point. Oh, absolutely. But I just said having Yingve as a person on the label must help with promotion for the band. I didn't ask any questions about Yingve. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, at, uh, at, at, at that time, yes. You know, but, uh, but with NZM, um, you know, this is like an uh, absolutely separate project. Absolutely. So how was it now that you have the band formed, you have the members that you want, you put out Eternal Fire, which was the first record in 2014. I mean, how did the band come together? Were there people that you knew that you wanted to play with, or they were just random people? Um, no, no, no. Uh, well, all the musicians are probably the best in South Florida. This is where I, where I live. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> there was many members, uh, you know, I had a, <laughs> three or four four or maybe five drummers until now and, and bass players, but, uh, but the guitar player, uh, the latest one is Denver Cooper. And he's, uh, he's been with me for almost 10 years, you know, a little bit less ten, nine years. So the, the eternal fire was actually a, a, a different guitar player. He's also very good. Yeah. But he moved to another city. So then Denver Cooper came and, um, basically me and him, we are the, you know, the, the core of the band, you know, well, I would say the engine, you know, and, uh, you know, even though I compose most of the songs, but uh, he's definitely helping with the guitar arrangements, you know, and, and things like that. You know, I play keyboards, I sing, I produce everything, but, uh, you know, he <laughs> he's the one that does guitars and, and in most cases, the bass guitar as well. Yeah. Is it important to have a collaborator, somebody to work with when it comes to writing music, or do you prefer to kind of do it all on your own and then see what the other guys can contribute to it to make it a, a better song? Well, I I kind of have have my uh, you know my own style. I have my own studio, and the way I I I, I do uh, you know I compose the the melody, the song. However, there is uh, always collaboration on on the guitar riffs arrangements you know a lo- little bit here and there and um, on the on the last record uh, actually um, one song uh, the, which is uh, the end of days which is on the best of NZM and also on the previous record rise about uh, that song we uh, it was a true collaboration uh, with me and Denver so the you know but the rest of it is mostly um, Mostly I do the thing, you know, everything with the song, with the demo. You know, I play guitar a little bit, so, you know, but then he comes and really, you know, <laughs> does the final touch on guitars. And he's a really good, excellent guitar player. Yeah. Rise Above came out, I think, about a year ago. It was it was the last studio record that you guys put out. Now you have this Best Of record, and yeah. it features a little bit of your whole career and some new songs on there. What about the next studio record? Is it something that you're working on, looking to maybe get out next year? Oh yeah. As a matter of fact, I just finished one song two days ago, and, and today I I start working on another one. I already have four songs, kind of ready, but you know, still it work in progress. You know, 
Yeah. Like this is right now. It's in the stage where I where I basically, uh, you know, have the whole track um, with my vocals, backing, keyboards, drums, um, keyboard, bass, and and also I play guitar, which is like not really, you know, what I have in mind. You know, I have something in mind, but I can't play that that good. So, so I'm waiting on on Denver to come and to really, you know, do do his. Uh, magical thing and uh you know and then the song will, will become alive also the other song is just like a basically um uh, you know a sketch you know just the vocals some keyboards some drums basic drums but nothing yet you know but i already have four songs pretty much you know just waiting on uh, arrangements and mixing and stuff like that yeah definitely definitely next year 100 percent we'll, we'll have a brand new album That'll with, be great. with 12 new songs you know, yeah, when you when yeah. you listen to your music, you definitely feel that neoclassical style of metal in there, and some songs sound extremely complicated. That there's a lot going on in there. I mean, is songwriting something that's natural to you, or did you really have to work at it? Um, I uh, I went to the classical music school, you know, when I was a kid, when I was seven. You know, well, I, I actually you know went to elementary school and and. Uh, elementary classical school at the same time. So I have these roots, you know, of the <clears throat> classical music and, uh, and uh, definitely, you know, um, love for Beethoven, for Paganini, you know, Bach, you know, and uh, uh, definitely, you know, has like a little, little influence on, on what, what I do, but not, I, I wouldn't say it's like a symphonic metal or something like that, you know. I, and it's, it's just a, I would just say I would just say it's a good heavy metal, you know. It can be sometimes progressive, maybe a little bit power metal, you know. And it's, but it's definitely not 100% symphonic metal. Yeah, I don't hate a symphonic in it at all. I, I know exactly what you're saying. You know, when you think about it, you know, classical yeah. music, those classical composers from hundreds of years ago, they were really the first heavy metal stars. The stuff they were doing, you know, lends so well to heavy metal music. Yeah, yeah. Oh. You see the the you know the rock and and all the basically all, all all genres that we have today they came from blues, you know this is the and the blues scale and everything so so um, basically uh, classical music uh, uh, merge with the with the with the blues and this is uh this is what what is the outcome you know. It's like a progressive metal and everything, and all, all the harmonies, different approach, which is, uh, you know, inevitable, you know, of course. Very true. Do you remember your first band? Were you a kid when you started it? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was, I was 12 years old. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and, yeah, yeah, and, uh, I'm trying to remember. I think the, the, the first song was something from Deep Purple, you know, and trying to, to learn, oh yeah, um, you know some Child in Time, Sweet Child in Time. Yeah, it's yeah. So it's like a very um, you know distinguished uh, keyboard intro. So I tried to, to learn that hours and hours. I was only twelve, 12 years old, <laughs> you know. And um, yeah, that's that's the first first band. It was called Ray of Light or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I got that. I mean, did you know early on that you wanted to be in a band and make a band something that was going to be, you know, your life's work and your career? Uh, or did you say you just wanted to be like a studio musician where you would play with anybody and anybody just to be able to play music? Um, I honestly, I just just have tremendous love for music. I uh, When I was three or four years old, I I was... I sang in front of the crowds for, for the family, for friends, you know, I was like a kind of, a, I, I guess, you know, I have some, some uh, old tapes, you know, of, of me and it was pretty good. And then I went to, to musical school. My, my parents wanted me to be a lawyer or something, this, you know, and uh, actually I went to, to university for, you know, for college for like a one year. And, and after, after um, like ten or eleven months, I decided, you know what, this is not for me, and uh, I I chose different routing, you know. So I, I said, I I, I want to be a musician. I don't want to waste time, you know, doing something that I don't like at all, 
and um, and that's it. And then from from that point on, you know, I have to mention, yeah, as you know, I grew up in former Yugoslavia, which is um, the part is, uh, where I grew up is Belgrade, Serbia. Yeah. And um, you know, um, so um, so uh, I didn't have any any um, you know particular like you know um, goal to be like a superstar or something. I just wanted. I just wanted to express, I just want to sing, compose, play, and whatever it takes me, you know. But I always, in the back of my mind, I, I always, always uh, dream about going to the United States, of course. You know, that was like uh, <laughs> my dream. Yeah. You know, and. Uh, uh, what came first for you? I mean, were you, did you start on the keyboards first and realize that you also had a good voice and could sing, or were you singing it first, then took on the keyboards next? No, no, no. Keyboards first. Yeah. Keyboards were actually, yeah, the first couple of bands, we were just playing instrumentals when I was, you know, my teenage years. Didn't, I, I thought it was like kind of cheesy and corny to, to sing. That was like, oh, come on, you know, this is like, you know. <laughs> and then later on, uh, we, there was another band that got much better gigs than us. And they have a singer. I said, wait, wait a second, somebody has to start singing because, you know, just playing instrumental doesn't go... Anyway, that that's that's true. And then I, yeah. Then you. And then I, then I, then I said, well, yeah. Then I started from, you know, I remember at the beginning, um, when I tried to sing something high, it was like, it was just really, really, it was really hard, you know. And uh, I, I remember by, by practicing and and gradually increasing the range. You know, and uh, you know, I always, always, uh, I was always amazed by, um, you know, the high pitch heavy metal singers. You know, and uh, my my favorite band was actually Dokken. Uh, you know, and and I tried to to catch these high notes. I said, oh, how how does she do it? Then the other one was Ian Gillen. You know, like yeah. you know, screaming and uh, you know, in a high pitch. I said, how does he do this? You know, and uh, and then little by little, I I got it. I said, oh, I can do it. You know. So, yeah, but definitely I, I started as a as a um, keyboardist first. Yeah, I, I guess it took some time before you became comfortable being a singer and keyboard player and doing both at the same time. Yeah, yeah, I can. Uh, well, you know, it's it's still it's it's uh, uh, very difficult to to play and sing at the same time, and it's also. You know, um, the, the way I, I, I do with NZM, I'm actually fronting the band and the keyboard is on the side, you know, and I, I literally play harmonies with one hand and uh, on the left hand I have microphone. So, and then I have a, um, when I, when it's time to play a solo, I have a, um, I put a microphone on the keyboard where there's like a, you know, a special pad. To, that they can hold the microphone, and you know, then I, then I play the solo, then I go back to singing. So that's that's how I perform. Yeah. You know. You know, if you think back to the '80s, some of the the biggest songs had keyboard, you know, intros or keyboard parts that were made the song famous. Uh, Ronnie James Deal with you know with uh, did, was big for that in a lot of songs. Ozzy with Mr. Crowley, you know, Rainbow in the Dark with Dio. And yet, when they went out on tour, yeah. they always hit the keyboard play off to the side. They never let them get up on stage and play. And I never understood that because exactly. you know, most of those songs yeah. had keyboards in them. And, you know, they were predominant. And so, why hide the guy off stage? Do you think it was because they didn't want people knowing that they had a keyboard player back then? Uh, I, I know this is kind of, you know, back in the, actually, the 60s and 70s, you know, keyboard, keyboard was one of the most important instruments. Yep. And then... In '80s too, and then and kind of lost the values, you know. And uh, it, it doing, for example, I think uh, I, m- I met a guy that uh, that played with Iron Maiden, but he's behind the curtain, so you don't see him on the stage, yeah. you know. And and, and uh, you know, there's many bands that do the same thing, or you know. So um, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of kind of sad. Depends on the on, on the music, you know. You know, but it's definitely um, it's guitar oriented. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, world building, yeah. How is it being a South Florida? So this is a kind of ex- exception. 
I'm sorry, Nick. I mean, I was. Uh, how does it feel to be a, a metal band in South Florida? Not exactly what you would consider a hotbed for heavy metal. So do you really have to kind of get the band out there to go play live in like at different places? Yeah, uh, believe it or not, there 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 was a actually scene, but uh, lately, like since since pandemic, I think it kind of uh, even with whatever we had, even even the you know. Um, it, it disappeared. It's like only few clubs left. Many of them are closed, and then there's like only few bands left. Uh, but at one point, um, when I came like ten years ago, they they were they were like at least like a twenty twenty uh, really strong bands. We used to have this uh, you know um, shows. Uh, there was a famous club, Churchill's. I don't know if you ever heard of it. it yeah. Unfortunately, that it, it doesn't exist anymore. But it's just like a famous. The club, for example, Marilyn Manson played there, and that's where where the the John uh, or what's his name John Tower, uh, God bless his soul, he died a few years. He discovered him there, in in and and then he you know <clears throat> uh, made his career basically. But uh, that was one of the the place there. You know, a pr- pretty strong heavy metal scene. You know. Well, that's good to know. I mean, yeah, I'm going to let you go in a few yeah. minutes, Nick, because I want to play some music off the album, and we're going to wrap up tonight's show. But what do you have planned for the rest cool. of 2024? Any shows lined up? Anything, any touring? Anything happening? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I, I have a few local shows. Actually, we did one just uh, two days ago. And the next one is um, August 16th. And uh, um, then I, I have to attend... Uh, the world tour with uh, Mr. Malstein, but right after that, which is the well, basically the end of year, uh, we we are planning to come to California and do like a little, little mini tour, and then we we have also some European shows for next year. And uh, you know, and um, as we speak, that you know, people are calling me and trying to to see well, you know, where else we're gonna go? Probably Mexico. I have uh, I played there before. You know, and uh, definitely Europe, you know, and California. This is so far confirmed. Well, well, that's great that you're going to be busy this year. You got the big tour coming up. You'll be out there playing shows. I'm happy for you. The best of NZM is out right now on Fire Rock Music Group. I mean, give me a song to play off the record. Um, well, you know, you, you can de- you can definitely play the new song, uh, No Innocence, which that's the only new track. But from the from the other song, like try. Uh, song to be with you that's kind of buried there but i think it's a really good song you got yeah. it Nick. i will do that you have a great night my friend take care and the best of luck with the band thank you mike appreciate it you too take care bye bye all the best okay bye
Close Within from NZM. We're going to get some more music and then wrap it up here tonight. Uh, okay, let me see what we got to do over here. Hey, next week, great show next week. Uh, Deborah Levine from Lady Beats will be on the show next week. Also, Chris Slade, the drummer from ACDC during the Thunderstruck era. And Chris has been in so many bands. He's got the Chris, Chris Slade timeline right now, which kind of features all the music that he's done over the last 60 years. Uh, it's going to be a different interview than anything we are doing the show because Chris played with Tom Jones. So we're going to talk about Tom Jones because I, <laughs> I love Tom Jones. He's been in ACDC multiple times. Asia, Man for Man's Earth Band. He wrote, you know, he did Blinded by the Light, that big hit song that Bruce Springsteen wrote and they did a cover of. So it's going to be a pretty fun interview. I mean, there's going to be a lot to talk about. Hope I can get all in in the time that we have to do the interview, but we'll see what happens. And uh, Lady Beast always been such a big fan of that band, so it would be nice to talk to Deborah next week. All right, let's see. Let's uh, just, you know what? We only got about 20 minutes left. We had a lot of talking tonight. Uh, so let's do some more music. You want to know what's funny is that the PR person that set up the interview with MZM tonight told me you cannot talk about Ying Fei Malmsteen. Don't mention him. Don't bring him up. Then they send you like the one sheet, which is like a press release that things they want you to highlight and talk about on the show. I never actually use it or go by it because I just do my own interviews. I can kill us what they write on there. But the entire one sheet and the entire press release does nothing but talk about Ying Fei Malmsteen. So I kind of find it funny that nobody wants to talk about it on the air or during the interview. But the entire press release is all about him being with Ying Fei Malmsteen. There's like maybe two or three lines about his own band and the rest of all Yingve. Go figure that one out, huh? I don't think I ever could. All right, how about we do a little Snow White? I, I can't remember the last time I played him on the show. Live for the weekend. <laughs>
All right, Hot Rod to Hell with from Rapid Fire. And before that, Randall Flag by The Beast. You know, that was off the, the Born to Metalize compilation that was out on Metal Force. I want to say it was 1984, I believe. I, I wanted to get every band from that compilation on the show. I managed to do three out of the four bands. We've had Dan and Alan from uh, Hades on the show. We've had all the guys with Torture Dog on here. We've had Sneak Attack on. I just could not find any member of The Beast. Sean Kelly, who was in the Beast, I think, but he was like in the the end towards the end of the band. I believe he played on the last demo tape that they had out. Um, I can't really remember, but he's in like a band called Dimmac. They're pretty popular, uh, and I tried to get him on the show, but he never really responded to me when I reached out for him. So maybe I got to try again. Not if Facebook is around, and maybe I could find one of the guys on there and uh, get them on the show, and I could wrap up that whole Born to Metalize interview cycle. Looking forward to doing that. All right, we're going to wrap it up here tonight. One more song. I want to thank Nick and Mike for being on tonight's show. Two good guests, and pick up the records if you can. Next week, Deborah Levine from Lady Beast, Chris Slade from ACDC, Asia, Tom Jones, and the biggest thing is that he played with Olivia Newton-John, and that's my sweetheart. So maybe we'll talk to him about that too. You're not going to get a lot of heavy metal talk next week in that interview, but it should be pretty interesting. Okay, let's close out here tonight with, uh, how about with the Wings of Steel? I've been getting more and more into this record as time goes on. It came out about a year ago. I think it's being re-released now in M-Theory. Uh, they're going to put it out. Uh, the band did it independently, I believe, last year. So keep your eye out for that. Let's do, see, let's do Cry of the Damned. Take care, everybody. Have a great week. I'll see you next Sunday night. Let's go!